for the proof of the CLO theorems, we have options. For instance, in Hurstein's Topics in Algebra, he gives several proofs. For us, we don't want any fancy machinery. We just want to use elementary methods, including, say, group actions and the class equation. Now, our scenario, we have G as a finite group. The order of G is given as P to the K times M. P is a prime. P and M are relatively prime. So here we're just splitting off the largest power of P in the order of the group. The first CLO theorem states, there exists a subgroup P of order P to the K in G. If we have any subgroup with that same order, we call it a CLO P subgroup. Now, for the proof, we're gonna take the main ideas that we use when we showed that for a P group, okay, that's a group whose order is a power of a prime. P groups have subgroups of each order of power of a prime less than the order of the group. Now, the way we showed that, if the subgroup didn't arise naturally, we look for a non-trivial element in the center, passed to a quotient group, found our subgroup there, and then pulled it back with an inverse image. Now, we're going to use induction on the order of the group. For our base case, okay, we could start with, okay, just take the one element group or the two element group, and then we can get base case easy. Might as well start with base case where P divides the order of the group. So then we can pull out Cauchy's theorem. Okay, so P is dividing with just exponent one. Cauchy's theorem says we have an element X in the group whose order is equal to P. That's gonna generate a subgroup isomorphic to Z mod P, and that'll be our CLO P subgroup in this case. Now, for the induction step, we'll just assume the theorem's true for groups where the order of the group is less than or equal to N. We'll assume that our group has order P to the K times N equal to N plus one. Now, first, we run things through the class equation. So let's recall, class equation says we have a finite group G, or the group equals the order of the center of the group, plus the sum of the orders of conjugacy classes for elements that are not in the center. Okay, and here we just use one representative per class. Now, we wanna focus on the elements that are not in the center. So if we take the centralizer of one of these elements not in the center, say x, okay, that's given by a set of all g in the group, such that g and x commute, okay, and this is a subgroup. We know it, since this is not in the center of the group, order of the centralizer is strictly less than the order of the group. We have two cases. If p of the k divides the order of the centralizer, so our subgroup's gonna arise naturally, then induction says we have our CLO P subgroup in the centralizer, and then that means it's just gonna sit in the group itself. Otherwise, we're gonna have the P of the K divides no centralizer for these elements not in the center. Now, if we use the cardinality formula for the number of elements in a conjugacy class, okay, that's gonna say number of elements in the conjugacy class of X is equal to the order of the group divided by the order of the centralizer of x. P of the k does not divide the centralizer. Then we're gonna be left with a factor of p in here. So p divides the order of these conjugacy classes. Now, if we look at the class equation, p divides all of these terms, p divides this term. This term here, okay, the center has at least the identity element in it, so that's not zero. Okay, this number is greater than or equal to one. But because we have P dividing this term and this term, P divides this term. So that's gonna give us that the order of the center is greater than or equal to P. Because P divides the order of the center, Cauchy's theorem says, center contains an element of order P. So let's call that X. We take the subgroup generated by X, call that H, that H has P elements and H is normal in G because X is in the center. Now we can form the quotient group G mod H with the quotient map Q, which carries each Y and G to the coset YH. If I want to count the number of elements in G mod H, 
We have the order of G divided by the order of H, which gives P to the K minus one times M. And that's strictly less than the order of G. So induction applies to give us, we'll have a subgroup P prime and a quotient group with order P to the K minus one. Now, to get a subgroup in G itself, we'll take the inverse image of P prime under Q. Recall, definition of the inverse image, it's gonna take all X in the group, such that Q of X is in P prime. Because P prime is a subgroup of the quotient group, Q is a homomorphism, we can show that the inverse image is actually a subgroup in G. Now, we wanna count the number of elements in the subgroup. We have the H is a subgroup in P, Okay, just check what happens when we let x be an element of h. And we'll have that p prime is equal to the quotient subgroup p mod h. Now with this, we could start counting. The order of p prime is gonna be equal to the order of p divided by the order of h. So that'll say the order of p is equal to p of the k minus one times p, or p of the k. So p is gonna be a CLO p subgroup, and we have our result. Now, one thing to note, in the proof we have, okay, so if G is a simple non-abelian group, if I wanna get CLOP subgroups, okay, the center here is gonna be equal to the identity. So we'll look in the smaller groups given by the centralizers of each element X, where the order of X is equal to P. Now that's not gonna give you precisely a CLOP subgroup, it's just gonna cut down the size of the group that you're searching in. Now, if I take the example, say, of A5, okay, here our CLO2 subgroups are gonna have order four, okay, so four is gonna be dividing 60, but eight doesn't. And if I take the centralizer of the element, say, one, two, with three, four, centralizer is gonna be given by these products of disjoint two cycles and the identity, okay? And in this case, it just happens that centralizer gives us exactly the CLO2 subgroup. For the next step, we show the third CLO theorem. In turn, we'll use that to prove the second. Now, let's consider our group action by conjugation on subgroups. The group we'll use here is gonna be P, the CLO P subgroup that we just found. Our set is gonna be the set of CLO P subgroups. Okay, the set is not empty. We know there's at least one element in it. If I take a subgroup, conjugate by an element in G, we get another subgroup of the same order. So conjugation is gonna carry our CLOP subgroups back to themselves. Now, the third CLO theorem states, the number of CLOP subgroups is congruent to one mod P. Now, to show this, we start with the following statement. So we have a CLOP subgroup, P prime in G, then P prime is the unique CLO P subgroup in the normalizer of P prime. So recall, the normalizer of P prime is just gonna be subgroup in G, okay? We're gonna have elements G and G, such that if we conjugate P prime by G, we get P prime back. Now, this just says the normalizer of P prime is the largest subgroup of G that contains P prime as a normal subgroup. Now, for our proof, let's suppose I have another CLO P subgroup called P, such that P is contained in the normalizer of P prime. Because P prime is normal in its normalizer, we can form the quotient group. So I'll call that Q. To compute the order of Q, Okay, we're just gonna divide the order of the normalizer by the order of P prime. Both of these are gonna have divisors of P to the kth power, so they're gonna cancel, and what's left over will not be divisible by P. So P does not divide the order of this quotient group. On the other hand, I wanna be able to pick some X that's in P, but not in P prime. Now this X is not the identity element, so X is gonna have order P to some power, say J, where J is greater than or equal to one. 
Now, inside the quotient group, I can consider the coset xp prime. Okay, so we're going to think of this as an element of q. Because it's not equal to p prime, that just says that as an element, it's not the identity element in q. So that's going to mean, because the order of x is a power of p, p is going to have to divide the order of xp prime as an element in the quotient group. Now that would mean we'd have to have p dividing the order of q, and we know that's not going to happen. So we get a contradiction. So that gives us our result. Now, how do we use this? Well, what we want to do is compute the order of orbits of CLOP subgroups under p. Now, when we compute orders of these, we're going to need to know what the stabilizers are. Okay, that's part of our formula. The number of elements in an orbit is equal to the order of your group divided by the order of the stabilizer. So if we compute this stabilizer, what do we get? We're going to have all g in our group p, such that p prime is normalized by g. So if we conjugate, we just get p prime back. Well, these elements g are going to be in the normalizer of p prime, but we're only restricted to the ones that are in p. So we're going to have the intersection of the normalizer of p prime with p. Now note, by this statement here, we can't have all of p in the normalizer. And this is going to be a subgroup of p. So that means it's going to have order p to a power, but not power k. So it's going to be smaller than k. Now, where are the possibilities? If we consider the orbit of p itself, we have exactly one element in the orbit, which is p. Otherwise, if we have p prime not equal to p, the number of elements in the orbit, here we take the order of the group divided by the stabilizer. So we'll have p of the k divided by p of the l, where l is strictly less than k. So we're going to have some genuine power of our prime. Okay, so it's not equal to 1. Now, if we go back to the partition of the set of CLOP subgroups under this action, we have CLOP subgroups as a set being written as a disjoint union of orbits. So we'll have the n sub p is equal to, okay, we have 1 plus a sum of powers of p. So what I have is n sub p is equal to 1 plus a multiple of p which is the same as saying that n sub p is congruent to 1 mod p, and that's our theorem. Now, for the second CLO theorem, okay, we want to show that all CLO p subgroups are conjugate. If we assume that this is not the case, we'll get a contradiction to our statement here. So what we'll show is, is that p must divide the number of CLO p subgroups. Now, if we assume this is not so, then we're going to have at least two orbits under the action by G. So let's suppose we have the orbit for CLOP subgroup P and P prime, not equal. We're going to show that P divides the order of each of these orbits. So when we put them all together, that means P will divide the number of CLOP subgroups. That'll give us our contradiction. Now, if I consider okay, the normalizer of p acting on the orbit for p prime, okay, so that'll be a group action, and we're going to get another partition. Only here, it's going to partition the orbit of p prime into smaller orbits, which I'll call omega sub p double prime. Now, if we want to compute the number of elements in each of these, okay, we just use our formula. So we take the order of our group, which is okay, the order of the normalizer of P. Then we're going to divide by the stabilizer. And as before, just work it out, you'll see that you get okay, the order of the normalizer of P intersect with the normalizer of P double prime. Now, this can contain a CLOP subgroup for G. So the biggest divisor it can have of P will be some P of the L, where L is strictly less than K. We know that p of the k divides okay, the order of the normalizer of p. So what happens is we're going to have p times some non-zero integer 
when we clear this up. So that's going to mean order of each omega is going to be a multiple of p. So the order of each orbit under g is going to be a multiple of p, which means the number of CLO p subgroups is a multiple of p, giving us a contradiction to the third CLO theorem.